Everyone's muted, John. So I think you need to unmute the speakers. I don't uh, know how we do that. I think you guys can unmute yourself now. So oh, we'll, we'll okay. just roll like that, and and I'll I'll play I'll play the mute button on anybody that's uh, disrupted. Okay. Cool. All right. I'm gonna let everybody when in. We're not talking. What? Should we be muted when we're not talking? Sure. No. Oh. Whatever you think. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, we'll just let people get in and we'll start. Okay. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our first in conversation with grantees this morning. And we're really excited to have you here. This is a short coffee. Um, conversation just to start your day off. And um, it is part of what we're doing instead of requiring final reports, we're asking folks just to share what their, their work is. Um, so today we have three grantees that are approaching um, trauma, healing and wellness from very different perspectives. Um, so we have Pierre from Forward Momentum. Forward Momentum is a dance education organization in Chicago. And his grant is really having him think through how does, how do his dancers, how do his teaching artists and how, how do they build social, emotional and trauma informed supports um, into their curriculum? So he's really focused on and if those young people who come in his door and making sure that they have all the supports that they need. We also have uh, Hoda from Blue Tin Productions, which is a workers cooperative that does apparel manufacturing. And for Hoda, whose cooperative members are really working class women, often immigrants, um, of color um, who come uh, to the US um, with lots of trauma from working in sweatshops. How do you build in the types of supports um, and develop um, healing practices within the workplace? And then um, we have Jacinda and Jaquanda from Kumba Links. And Kumba Links is taking yet a different approach and they're really looking at um, so Kumba Links has always been doing healing and trauma and um, community engagement. And you guys will correct me if I don't describe you uh, the way you want to be described through um, hip hop. And their grant is helping them think through how to create a healing arts and wellness space that would really provide traditional healing arts to their community of artists, their community of youth, and the community in which the broader community in which they're engaged in. And so I'm gonna start just by having each of them introduce themselves, talk about what inspired their project, and then we'll get a little bit deeper into um, what, they're, what they're up to. So I think Hoda, we'll start with you. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I was feeling a little bit unwell this morning. So if anything I say it comes off as delirious, it's probably because I am. Um, so I apologize in advance. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, my, the work that I'm involved in is called Gluten Production. So our namesake is the Danish Gluten cookie container that a lot of mothers or grandmothers probably actually store their sewing container in and not cookies. Um, so we are um, a workers cooperative. So I know that we're probably addressing um, things a little bit different than um, what a lot, a lot of, I think, typical grantees might be applying for is that we um, we're like an actual business 
and um, we're we're an LLC, so we're not actually a nonprofit, but we have fiscal sponsorship um, because we believe that our members who are working class women of color should deserve economic mobility and get paid um, well, <laughs> not just like barely getting by or survivable wages or even living wages in Chicago, which are survivable wages, but have the ability to like live fully holistic, um, thriving lives. So for us, I think um, there are a lot of uh, complications in working in an industry like fast fashion or fashion in general, particularly at the bottom of the supply chain, um, especially given that the majority of the clothes that um, all of us wear and not to reach, but assuming that the majority of people in this room right now are wearing some form of sweatshop clothes, um, given that the majority of clothes are actually produced at the expense of particularly women of color around the world, both abroad and in the United States. Um, there are huge sweatshop rings in LA, in New York, a few here in Chicago as well too. And so for us, just the, the basic idea of how can we like make sure that our team is paid and paid well and have agency um, within the supply chain is complicated in and of itself. But on top of that, how can we actually like view our team as like, like complicated holistic people that have complicated holistic needs beyond just economic mobility. Um, what does it mean if you're getting money, if you have so much trauma and you can't deal with that or the movements that you're doing like running machines um, causes like physical stress. And so for us, um, I think this is something that we've been thinking about a lot is like how can a, a workplace um, and an anti-capitalist idea of what a workplace could look like actually be a site of healing, not a place that you just go to get money and come home, but how can we actually also grow and heal and build community and learn in the same place um, rather than think of those as like separate silos. So I think COVID kind of like really drove this home for us because we saw that um, not only is, are we in a global pandemic now and garment workers being hit the hardest, but especially given that all of our members are also, again, working class and from communities that have the highest density of COVID rates in Chicago. And so every day when we were coming into the studio, our members would be like, I just had like five neighbors die. Um, I just have like three family members in the morgue. And so it was like incredibly extenuated that like our members are sort of at the intersections of so much trauma personally, but also by virtue of the systems that we live in. Um, and so we were really trying to figure out how can we create healing um, and safety outside of what the city defines as safety, outside of what the state defines as safety, but on our terms, um, based on what our members needed. So that's sort of a little bit about our project. And I'm sure we can get into details later too. Yeah, we'll talk about the uh, curriculum that you have and kind of some of the things that you're actually implementing very concretely. Um, but let's move to uh, Jacinda and Jaquanda at Kumba Links. Uh, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about how this idea for this healing art center came about for you. Jaquanda, do you want me to, to jump in first and then you jump in? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh, good morning. Now I see you. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jacinda. Jaquanda, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself because there's so many boxes. I'm Jaquanda. Please. So we're actually both in Atlanta right now um, getting some nature wellness, um, being bathed in all of this beautiful sunshine and outdoors. Um, but uh, about a year or so ago, we were able to um, officially kind of recognize, uh, do this, do this, create this space. So we've always done this work, but um, never been able to intentionally carve a space specifically for it. And so um, with the support of the Logan Foundation, we were able to open a storefront space just before the pandemic um, hit us. And um, now the space is, is more being used as a mutual aid kind of factory, if you will. But um, the intention of the space was really around um, specifically being able to carve time and capacity around folks, time, um, resources, um, just for our community and the, the families that um, we engage um, to support mental health and wellness and to think about um, arts as healing um, and bringing in things that we've always um, sort of had to have on the margins um, because we never could get funding for something like, um, you know, art, an art therapist or a talk therapist. We, we, we couldn't 
ask for funding for an acupuncturist or an herbalist. Um, and so we took it upon ourselves um, a few years back to just begin to study some of those practices ourselves. Um, and, and so, you know, to fast forward two years later, we are now in this space, practitioners of um, different forms of healing arts um, and wellness, um, and then also building community with other folks around the city so that in this space, we've done it virtually, but the, the hope is in this space eventually that we will be able to provide supports that we know we've always needed and we've sometimes had to outsource or just show up in the best way that we can with whatever tools that we had, you know, just tapping into our own DNAs. Um, but now we can bring in a collective of folks to support youth and their families in ways that we've been dreaming of and knowing that have been important for so many years. Thank you. Um, Pierre, uh, do you want to talk about forward momentum and the work you're doing in, kind of in putting trauma-informed work into dance curriculum and what that even means? Yeah, good morning. And again, thank you for having, uh, inviting me to be a part of this conversation. I think it's really valuable. One of the things that uh, we have, that we primarily do is we bring dance to children and communities with limited access to the arts. Uh, the, the, the group that we serve most are children in Chicago public schools. Um, and one thing that we can all attest to at this moment is that they have all switched over to a virtual learning. These students have been out of school, away from their friends, uh, dealing with the only things that they have going on in their own homes, in their communities, things that are happening nationally around the country. Um, and what we're seeing is we're starting to see a lot of the students kind of withdraw and pull back. Uh, we have classes that we teach about 100 classes per hour that are all virtual. But what we're also realizing is some of the students don't wanna turn their cameras on. They can't turn their cameras on for a number of reasons. Some of them might be personal, some of them just might not even be there. So what we wanted to do was try to figure out a way, how can we make connections with kids when they come out of this virtual learning experience? So when they go back to school, what are the some of the things that we need to be aware of as instructors, because typically as dancers and artists, we can't just go back to dance in the classroom as usual, because what we've got to do is figure out, okay, Pierre might be having a hard time today. He has been in class all year, but he hasn't had his camera on. So since his camera hasn't been on, how do we know he's actually participating in the program that's going on? Um, we also have adopted a, a, a mantra that comes from another organization that we work with, which is uh, compassion over compliance. We kind of want to find ways to engage the students to make sure that they are understanding, meeting them more where they are, as opposed to just saying, okay, everybody, let's get up and start dancing, because that is going to be a big problem. I don't feel that my instructors are equipped right now to be able to do that effectively. So one of the things that we're really trying to focus on through this grant process is how do we get the instructors, the information, the training, build some of those soft skills that they're going to need so that maybe Pierre might not be up for dancing today because there's something going on. How do we really kind of tap in more along what it is that the children we are serving are going through so that we can just be a little bit more compassionate about uh, how to most effectively engage them and support them in ways that we might not be, that might not be typical to us as dance instructors. Great, thank you. I'm gonna um, start us off with a question or two, but all of you on this call, this is about a conversation and <clears throat> sharing learning. So in the chat, if you have a question, if you have advice to share, whatever it is, please, um, please do so and we'll uh, accommodate as many folks as we can. Um, I, I wanna know um, how you think about balancing, you know, the delivery of art and wellness um, because you guys are first and foremost arts organizations um, and yet wellness is obviously core to everything you do and so I'll let any of you kind of take that but I, I'm just curious like where's that space um, or that that what's, how do you how do you manage that I'll go uh as a performer dancer and as someone who's still very connected to dance, personal wellness is not really at the forefront of what we do as artists. Because 
your job is to go out there and do the dancing, um, whether you're sick, whether you're hurt, whether you're having emotional or personal issues that are going on, we're just conditioned to be that way. And a lot of times we bring that into the classroom with us. Uh, we forget that we're dealing with children mostly for us. So our goal is to number one, try to switch the thinking around the instructors because if you're the second cast and you haven't rehearsed and the first cast person is out, you still got to get out there and go on. So trying to break us out of that mentality to say, it's okay if you're hurt, it's okay if you can't go on, we'll find another way, we'll find another ballet. That's a whole thing that number one has not, it wasn't a part of my training or my, my growth as an artist. Um, and sometimes we just get so caught, stuck up in, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, I gotta do it. Just trying to find a way to pull back and let people understand it's okay if you can. Yes. Um, I like to piggyback off of you, Pierre. Thank you for that. I think um, it's really important for us as teaching artists, um, as humans, to take a moment and pause and, and look at the world around us, see how it's affecting us, and understand that we can't show up for anybody unless we show up for ourselves first. So in our organization, we've been really intentional about supporting our teaching artists, around um, just whatever supports they need in this time. Like if it, it is, you know, you need an ear to get it all out, or if you need some uh, monetary support, we're looking for that. If you need um, resources for, you know, counseling, we're looking for that. And if you need a pause, we're gonna give you that because we know that it is your wellness that shows up for our youth, right? And we can't be an example or we can't be any help to anybody if we're not helped ourselves. So it has been in terms of shifting the, the, um, the way that we approach the work, it has started internally with our teaching artists, with our staff, with our, our crew, and really digging into how do we become healed in this moment of uh, this world, you know, and then how are we going to build out our arts, build out our programs, tap back into our youth that we have only seen through virtual um, means. And, you know, I think it's been, I think it's been helpful because our teaching artists have showed up with a little bit more, like, just feeling supported, you know, and not just thrown out there. Because honestly, when everything went down, the first thing that everybody was thinking about was, oh my God, like all of our contracts in our schools, all of our teaching arts are gonna get paid for the rest of the year. We just started half of our spring programming, you know? So um, we just, as, as leaders, just really stepped back and like, you know, tapped into some of our funders and just said, listen, like we have to honor these contracts for these teaching arts just so that they can is survive through this, you know, the end of this semester. And then we're going to have to figure out, you know, how do we continue to provide that programming? And, and, and yes, it's a challenge with them not turning on the cameras. Absolutely. Um, so just that alone, like, hits the morale of the teaching arts. There's our work is in person. It is a connected work. It is not through these boxes, you know. Um, so, so yeah, just really like tapping into to us as a, a people. I think. Yeah, so I'm really interested in what you're doing differently. And Hoda, in a conversation we had, you kind of described like how the day is different as now that you're incorporating a curriculum that you developed partially through the grant um, that is really focused on the cooperative members. You wanna talk a little bit about how each how the day is different than it used to be. Yeah, definitely. Um, and if I can also like tap a little bit at the end of that conversation, um, because something that I think is um, sometimes actually becomes a little bit frustrating that I actually notice, and I'm sure a lot of other um, people who are applying for grants here too might also share is that um, I think grant makers also oftentimes um, contribute to the siloing of like different aspects of programs. So there's like grants for arts and then there's grants for justice. Um, but all art is political, like all art is political. There's no such thing as apolitical art. And if our art is not engaging with politics and that can look like a lot of different things. It can look like art for healing. It can look like art for 
um, like questioning status quo. But if our art is silent and we're just painting flowers in the corner, that's privilege. That's not actually like engaging with what's happening on the ground. Um, so I think that all art is justice work if it's done correctly and if it's led by um, people of color trying to like in a very specific way to lead movement work. Um, I do think art is incredibly powerful. And so I think there's there should not be a gap between art and wellness, but I think there, sh and I, I, there is unfortunately, but I think that should be part of the art making process. Um, and I think it's also very gendered and race-based and class-based why these have been separated. Um, it's oftentimes um, women particularly who are not granted the access to care for yourselves. Um, if we think about mothers, if we think about working class women, women of color, we're never granted the ability to care for ourselves and have so much on our shoulders. Um, and so even having a conversation with the team about like, what things do you wanna learn? Um, and for like one of our members who has been a domestic violence survivor of like 30 plus years saying that she doesn't know how to care for herself, um, I think is like huge. And it speaks volumes um, that like mothers don't know what it means to take care of yourselves. And this is something that's so, so important. And so how can we actually bring this to the center of the conversation um, and implement this in a way that's like organically into the work rather than like, um, with all the respect to people in this room, but like white people saying like, oh, this is how you should heal. This is how like, this is what like trauma and care look like on my terms, but literally asking like, what do you need? Um, and, and how can we give it to you on your terms based on what you're identifying? And so I think that's something that I, I, I usually, I see as like a binary sometimes that shouldn't be. Um, and so for what we've sort of been doing is like developing a curriculum based on like collaboratively with all of our members, of course, we're workers cooperative, um, based on what people like genuinely want to learn for themselves. Um, and also thinking about, again, like some of re repetitive moments or movements of like making clothes. Um, like how can we do that in a way that also releases that tension at the end of the day. So we're trying to look also holistically about what care looks like, um, both in terms of physical wellness, um, we have like yoga classes that we've started based on everything that the members have wanted after work that focuses on the parts of the body that are under the most stress during um, production. We also have um, somatic coaching uh, twice a month. Um, and for those of you who don't know what somaticism is, I didn't also for this curriculum. It's basically in the West, we have this like idea that the, the body and the mind are two separate things that like information just comes from your mind and your body is like separate. Um, whereas in the majority of the rest of the world, we understand like the body and the mind are all part of one thing and our bodies also produce knowledge and information and how can we locate trauma within our bodies and communicate that for healing um, without having to like speak English fluently. So how can we also make all of the care accessible to our members who aren't fluent in English, but can still locate trauma within their bodies and heal. Um, and then we also have been introducing sort of a political education series as well as part of healing, because I think knowledge is power and knowledge is also healing. So especially during the uprisings this last summer, we had members um, who are both in Latinx communities as well as black communities asking why um, neither of them had public transit to be able to come to, and everything was shut down to be able to come to the studio. It was really important for us to be able to have conversations about politics, have conversations about abolition, have conversations about what was happening so that you can understand what's happening in your neighborhood and that those sorts of like the state violence isn't replicated within our studio um, because it's so easy um, to be able to, to replicate that and use that language and bring that into our studio if we're not actually also working on our collective healing of political education. So for us, we were trying to take a multi-pronged approach to thinking about where does trauma and pain and hurt come from and how can we think about these within the scope of our work, but also what everybody needs to feel totally whole while being able to be at the studio. Thank you. You know, it's interesting because this isn't new, right? But COVID really brought um, the urgency for this work to uh, the forefront in a broader way for more audiences and really um, made uh, existing trauma and stress more acute. Um, and, I, and so you all have been thinking about this pre-COVID, um, these grants are kind of mid-COVID, kind of what you need to change. And I'm just wondering, like Hoda, you mentioned one of the challenges has been funding that kind of segments justice and health and art. 
what are for any of you like what have been some of the other challenges as you try and be more intentional about incorporating wellness and 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 um and uh and healing into your work um I think, Hoda, you touched on this a little bit in the beginning. Um, there, there was so much pressure. Um, there has always been pressure, but particularly when the pandemics happened, um, and certainly now, it's like we're just back to what it was, you know, pre-COVID. Um, the pressure to, and I love this format that we can have a final report in this way. And I, and so, you know, I just, I think we, there's so much to learn from being, from challenging and shifting and, and trying new stuff. You know, uh, Kumalinks is a, is a collective of folks who are really about experimenting and trying new things. Um, and so, but the pressure was always on, right? Uh, the, the challenges were around, you know, data, very data driven still. I mean, even to this day, it's like we get asked, do you, can you have a, do you have a screenshot of how many folks attended? Do you, you know, can you, and I get that folks want to capture it, um, but, but yeah, it's just a lot of challenges around um, other folks defining what kind of expectations we should have of ourselves and the work that we, um, that we, um, you know, get to each day. Um, and that is huge. And I think um, a lot of us suffer already just from not being able to practice our traditions, our rituals, our ceremonies. And um, I mean, we, we, you know, as an indigenous person coming from historically, um, we're talking about late seventies before it was even legal to practice your spirituality. You know, that, that, that is carried among so many folks, folks who have in, whose peoples have endured ch um, chattel slavery. Like all of that is real and in real time being expressed. It's so close. It, it, it hasn't been that long. And so, and so being able to, the that's, that's a challenge in itself to show up in a world that has these expectations when folks are still grappling first, second, third, fourth generation, it's not gone. And we don't even, we haven't even reconciled it. We don't even want to talk about it in this country. That is a challenge. So on top of um, funders and just the world wanting things to get back to, you know, quote unquote normal, the, you know, on, on, on even larger challenges is that we have not even, we talk about transformative justice in kale all of the time. And for us, what that means is that we have to be accountable. We have to reconcile and we have to, pay up in some form or fashion um, to get this thing right and as we move towards equity. And that means we have, to, we have to experiment and try things, but we also have to acknowledge our history and our wrongdoings. And folks are walking with that um, unacknowledged. And that is the biggest challenge, I think. Thank you. Um, Pierre, I was gonna ask you um, kind of from, so, forward momentum is slightly different, right? Because your teaching artists are professional dancers <laughs> that don't necessarily think every day about, um, they think about teaching dance, right? And right, right. Yeah, um, it's, it's so interesting because like, Marsha, I'm glad you brought that up because I was sitting here thinking, wow, kind of, I think what we're doing might not be as deep as what some of the other, other, other groups are doing, but it, it, it's very different. I mean, our primary focus is, is to stir up the children, to really put all of our time, energy and effort on the development of the students. Um, and before all this happened, there was already this massive component of, of education called social and emotional learning. And for me, you know what it is, but basically social emotional learning really kind of talks about the things that you learn usually at home when you're growing up that you can use to become a better person. Well, they're having to teach that in school. We were doing a program really kind of focusing around social emotional learning through most of our curriculum. Then you add this component of trauma onto it. Now we've got to deal with, well, how do you be a nice person? How do you do the right thing? Then you deal with, you're dealing with, well, how do I get you to care about dance when somebody has just been murdered or there's a trauma going on within your neighborhood or your, your cousin or grandma or grandpa has just passed from COVID. It, it, it kind of has to shift around what it is and how do we engage the children to try to let make dance be a, 
an outlet or a source that they can go to for healing. Uh, someone asked the question if we've had any success with our, our, with our virtual programs. We've actually been pretty good. Uh, some are really good, some are not. And so the challenges for us is how do we support our teaching artist who is teaching a class with 27 children in it and only two kids have their camera on and those two have the camera on, but they're not, they're not engaged. Uh, so those are some of the, the bigger challenges that we have. So in an effort to kind of stay focused in on what it is that our grant is funding, how do we encourage that instructor to keep going? How do we give that instructor tools to try to more to engage the children more and uh, so that they can really be successful even if it's one child? And I'm kind of of the mindset that I can't save everybody. So the ones that I, I can get to and the ones that we can reach are the ones that we're gonna really put our time and most energy into. Not that we're leaving anybody behind, but you've got three kids who are coming in, 100% engaged, ready to dance, ready to move, fully committed. We've got to kind of really make sure that those kids continue to be while trying to pull these other kids or get those other kids engaged. And it's, it's a struggle. So thank you. I mean, I, I am curious, um, you know, we are seeing at the Arts Work Fund a ton of proposals coming in. We just had a, a grant cycle close. Um, where people are really thinking about how are they going to support their staff um, who have been facing trauma? How are they going to support um, themselves, their organizations? And I'm wondering, do you guys have any advice to groups that you know want to think more explicitly about addressing trauma and wellness within their organizations, whether it be the staff or the youth they serve, or in their in or like for you guys at Kumba Links, right? It's part of your DNA. It's how you kind of, you know, build it into your culture. So what would you, where, do, where should, how do folks start? What kind of resources are out there? A few, um, few quick thoughts. Um, I, think, I think it really depends on, and this is like the hardest end. I think it depends. <laughs> um, I think it really does depend on the level of trust in the organization. Um, because for example, like at Blue Ten, given we're a workers cooperative and we know um, we have a level of intimacy with each other's lives that's um, very strong, sometimes too much. <laughs> uh, and so there's already a deep level of trust there that it's easy for someone to come up um, and say, hey, like I need this. Um, because then I know where they're coming from. So it's really, really like easy. We've even had a situation where one of our members just casually over lunchtime talk with one of our members who has left a domestic violence situation. She realized she was in one. And then like a month later, she felt ready to leave. We literally like went to her house, like picked her up, like spent a day getting her everything we need. So we're very intimately engaged in everyone's lives. Um, so it's really easy for us. I think not very easy, but easier for us than it may be at other places. Um, so I think that on the baseline level, a level of trust has to be there for us to talk about like how to take care of people in a way that's like deeply meaningful and not just like check a box of like, oh, we did yoga together. Um, and I think specifically, and I, I wanna like challenge, I guess, like a, a helpful challenge of like white led nonprofits, there's not ever going to be trust there with um, staff of color um, if the leadership is all white because of historical violence, historical ways that the state also has used mental health or mental health needs um, to criminalize Muslims, for example, there are currently like active surveillance programs that criminalize Muslim mental health needs. Um, and so that like nonprofits actually get funding from without knowing or sometimes they do. So I think that there's really valid reason for there to be a level of skepticism and like unwilling to cooperate specifically between like white led organizations or white leadership and communities of color that either they're serving or like our staff. So um, one maybe like tangible way that for those organizations specifically to be able to address that is to allow like staff members of color to be able to create their own cohort and talk about amongst themselves what they need and then just say at the end of like, and nobody else attends, you know, a very like selective group that get to decide what they want and then come and say, this is what we need and being able to respect that without asking questions. Um, and so I think being able to 
to trust people and let them give them their space to decide what they need on their terms and being able to enact that I think can be really helpful in lieu of like a deeply trusting space um, that maybe already exists also but if not I think that there are other ways that like that can be built so that's like maybe one way. I think for us, we're a small organization. Uh, we, we have full-time staff people and we also have teaching artists. One of the things when this whole COVID thing started for us was to really reach out and provide any resource that we received from Artswork Fund or, or Polk Brothers or any organization that has something going on was really to kind of get that information out to share with them. Um, and for our staff, we did a couple of things. We had what we call stand-ups where everybody could just kind of come together and talk about what it was that was going on with them uh, and also to really regularly check in. I have, uh, we have weekly staff meetings. Uh, we have weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings between me and my staff. And one of the main components uh, for establishing the one-on-ones was to give everybody an opportunity to talk about anything that might be going on um, that they didn't want to talk about in front of the group. And the other thing that we really encourage our staff to do is, is to seek support. If they want to talk to someone, if they, if they're, they're interested in finding another person to talk to outside the people at the office, uh, we encourage them to do that. And we support that fully. Um, I would say also just being consistent, um, knowing that everything is continuously changing and that we have to continuously look for resources. Um, one thing that we've done is built um, a living document that list different um, organizations, peer organizations that are doing things to support artists that list different um, uh, different um, activist groups that we are working with right now um, and their movements and how we can support them, list different uh, doctors that, that, you know, are BIPOC and that are, you know, down for our people and not down to criminalize our people. Um, just really continuously looking for different resources and bringing that up in staff meetings you know always giving um reminding folks that this is you know everything's changing every day and this is how we're going to support you as well as well as we can every day it's not going to stop just because now it's 50 percent open in chicago and and everything's going to go back to normal like no like this is still changing so just really i think for our organization it's really been about consistency Thank you. I would add also to that, that, you know, um, and I, we, we've mentioned this a little bit, but just as a concrete piece is that continuing to have that collective conversation around um, showing up and, and uh, trying, what, what really it means to be, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric and talk um, these days around like, and, and what is anti-racism, right? It's not enough just to say I'm not racist, but to be anti-racist or uh, whatever, but in our work, it's really been central that we continuously have that political education piece. And I think it's beautiful. Um, this is this certainly didn't start with Kale, but it's it's always been a sentiment. But um, there is an org called Healthy Hood. Um, it's a collective. I'm not even sure if it's an NFP, but um, the one of the leaders is Tanya Lozano, and they do um, a, a gathering. I think it's each week on Mondays. And it's just a political education and it's just on different topics. You know, it's really about unpacking and unlearning a lot of the just oppressive ideas. And, you know, and it's set up in a way that anyone can enter because we all have our journey in this work, right? Depending upon the way in which we present in this world, depending on the things that we're invested in, the lived experiences that we've had. And the way she sets up that political education piece is really, and she's just a facilitator of it, is really you come, you know, uh, who you are, but you're doing, you're all committed collectively to do this work. Um, and so I think that that's a concrete piece is that folks that are going to engage with your community, your org, that you set a precedent like, yo, this is what it's gonna be. If you are in this space, these are the things, yes, you're gonna, you know, facilitate dance making, you might be a graffiti artist, but you're also going to participate in unlearning a lot of this BS that we are all, um, you know, we've all been our victims of in some way or another and how and, and that's your journey, but we're going to help to facilitate that. So I think holding space in that way is really critical. 
I wonder if you guys, if there's an infrastructure of uh, support out there. So, um, like Jaquanda, you mentioned that you're developing, like you've got this little resource list that you've put together. And Jacinda, you mentioned Healing Hood. And um, Hoda, you mentioned having like a somatic um, practitioner come in. But so I'm like, you know, theater A, and this is really critical to me. Um, is there a place for me to find um, the resources that I need to um, begin to um, think about healing um, and wellness in my in my company, in my ensemble, in my audience? Uh, yes, I would like to invite everybody to Life Force Arts Ensemble. And uh, we've been doing healing work through the arts for about 35 years. Um, I do a form of modern shamanic work. Um, and uh, we also have um, uh, healing arts intensives. And we also have youth scholarships. So anybody um, 18 to 29 years old can come and take our programs basically for free. Yeah. Thank so, you. Mm -hmm. You know, Marsha, I don't, I don't want to take up any more space. I know, so I'll just be real brief. I think that there's something here that we could probably compile out of this space. It seems like there's. I just opened up the chat, and it seems like there's lots of folks very interested asking questions, who have resources, and then we've shared some. This, this might be a, a good point to just kind of compile all of that, that together, so that it can live somewhere. I think that's great. If people have resources. Um, whether it be, um, you know, from curriculum to practitioners to um, whatever they've done, I think it's great to get that into the chat and we can um, make sure that everybody has that. Um, so um, I, I have a last question for you because we only have an hour and um, uh, though, um, I don't want to take up all the space either if folks in, on the call have questions, but I, I am curious, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you'll have a healing arts center at Kumba Links, you're going to have a new curriculum and approach to your cooperative members uh, at Bluetin and uh, Pierre, you're going to have a new way of training your um, your uh, teaching artists and relating with kids, you know, what, what's it gonna feel like um, if you're really successful to walk into your space in five years? Um, what kind of difference will, um, will somebody notice? I think for me, the, the, the difference will be, if we're successful with this, the difference is gonna be full engagement. Um, and hopefully within five years, a lot of the students that we're working with or the new students that we're working with will have passed through this. Because if you think five years from now, a child who's in the first grade will now be in the sixth grade and they will have had all that time to ease out. And so what we're hoping is that we can get really back to doing the solid work that we were doing, which is providing access to the kids and also helping children to identify a, a path that they want to use where dance can help them to reach their full potential. Yeah, I think um, for us, our goal is to be able, like we don't, we don't believe in intellectual property. So our goal is to be able to um, sort of formalize and develop the curriculum in a way that is really accessible um, to people to be, and publish and be able to support people who, who need something similar. Um, and also I think our, our ultimate goal as Bluetin is to be able to develop our model as a whole, as a worker cooperative, um, given we're the first of our kind in the United States uh, and try to actually develop our model in a way that can be replicable, not just in the United States, but on a global scale that really allows garment workers, particularly again, who are um, women of color to be able to build agency for themselves on their terms um, and thinking about how like healing can be implemented as part of that. So. Um, I, I think also like in line um, with what I think Jacinda mentioned about like being grateful that 
uh, this is a share back that like this rather than like data and numbers. I think that healing doesn't happen with one grant cycle. I think healing happens over years and years and years, especially when you are a domestic violence survivor of like 30 plus years, that doesn't happen overnight. And so I hope that in five years, we're still on a pathway toward um, a really deep healing um, and not uh, personally be naive to think that everyone's just gonna be like, all right, trauma done, <laughs> um, but get to a place where at least it's manageable um, people understand how to cope, how to deal, how to um, engage with their trauma and be able to like think about how the curriculum can be developed that's shareable, but also in a way that allows other organizations with different types of membership or different um, people who are involved also find ways that that can be applied in different situations. Um, so sort of a goal, but definitely down the line. <laughs> I think for our healing space, um... A goal is to become a space that is preventative and not reactionary. Um, we've had a lot of, you know, just in our 25 year journey, um, we've seen a lot of young adults between the, eight, the years of 18 and 25, you know, deal with a lot of like mental, you know, um, struggles and so a lot of the times that when they come to us it's you know now how do we react to what's going on but i hope that you know our space becomes a a tool bag you know for our young adults who are getting out there and, and learning how to be on their own to have tools to fall back on to have uh, a space where they can tune up their you know healing practice remember you know that these are practices that come from their ancestry and and implement them before they reach a point a breaking point quite honestly and so uh i i really want it to be a space where they know that in addition to creating their art and showing up just as you know trying to make it as a human every day that they have a place where they can go and you know get some shiatsu from Jacinda or, uh, you know, take a yoga class from a Jaquanda or a, a Black or a BIPOC instructor. Because a lot of times also we're so disconnected from these type of healing practices because we don't see us offering them. And so I hope that this is a space where they can connect and feel confident in, in the traditions and, and the, the healing practice that they have within themselves. Thank you. Uh, we are almost at time. Um, if you are not on the AWF Connect listserv, go on our website and register because that's where we're going to get all of the resources that have come through the chat out to folks um, as quickly as possible. And we're also going to have um, a, a recording of this conversation um, up on our website in the short term. Um, you know, uh, I, I just want to open it up to the folks on the in the conversation. Um, if there's anything else anyone wants to add or share before we close out our um, coffee conversation this morning and you start your uh, your day. Okay, well, uh, my uh, series had a question. Uh, so um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I think that the work you guys are engaged in is so critical. I think that um, I feel honored that Arts Work Fund can be supporting some of this work. Um, and the thanks really goes to uh, an amazing group of uh, review panelists that we've had looking at these proposals that have brought a totally different perspective to how we think about um, the proposals that, that we're reading. Um, we'll be having more of these conversations on different topics just looking at um, clustering grantees based on doing similar work and what they're learning. If anybody has suggestions for furthering conversations, um, we're glad to help facilitate that. Um, but thank you um, everyone for your time this morning.
All right, and thank you uh, for sharing uh, to Kumba Links, Blue Tin, and to Forward Momentum. Thank Have you. a good day. Thanks so much for having us.